Hey fam, welcome back to another episode of I'm Telling You. With uh, you, as always, it is us, your hosts, <laughs> Philly D. And Mr. Gemini. Yeah, and uh, if you want to uh, continue the conversation, because we would love for you to do that, go ahead and send us an email. You can uh, do the clicky-clacky thing and shove it on over to uh, I'm Telling You at directionsofmusic.org. That's I-M-T-E-L-L-I-N-Y-O-U at directionsofmusic.org. And uh, yeah, it's uh, first time listeners. This is, uh, I'm telling you, it's a 30 year friendship of uh, me and Mr. Gemini just, uh, I don't know, <laughs> being as schmucky as possible without maybe. I don't know. It's just our conversations, man. That's all it is. Yeah, that's how it happens. We, uh, we you wanted to hit record. Yeah, I did. Uh, as, you know, kind of a semi joke, but not really. And then it turned into this, which here is, we are. Is also a semi joke, but not really. <laughs> Oh, um, it's just life, isn't it? Just a semi joke, but not really. I don't know well, if you. Uh, it's only pain. I mean, it hurts, but if you take what is it? If you uh, if you take life too seriously, you'll never get out alive. Was it they say? <clears throat> yeah. Well, right. And then uh, oh, yeah, I'm oh, gonna, we're yeah. right into it. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, this is what we do. See, I'm telling you, dude. When you don't have a table, you don't get it on stuff. Just on me. Well, that's allowed. That's okay. Yeah, first time listeners, we also crack beers. We crack jokes. We we crack Decker. our joints because <laughs> we're old and Yeah. Yeah. A little pop here and there. Don't yeah. worry about it. Had too much pop. It's not the equipment. Well, I mean it's the equipment, but it's not yeah, the sound you, equipment. Can you there you go. There we go. Yeah. <clears throat> I always say it helps you to talk on the mic because <laughs> people can actually like hear you. I mean, not that I think anybody really wants to hear you, but you know, if they did, you have Damn, to do man. that. No, I'm just talking to you, man. <laughs> Dude, pretty much. Yes. Talking to you. What people? Who? All the for the people in the back. In the back of what? Exactly. Exactly what? Exactly. All right, moving on. Literary man. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we also uh, we also do movie quotes. We quote ourselves now too, which is you know we've been doing that for a little bit. I think that's quite comical. Why not? I mean, you know, there's everything right with that. Of course there is. <laughs> of course there is. Like, we're just talking about, you know, the judgment that might come from this whole uh, movie rating idea that we have. And it's like, you know, when it all boils down, it's just, it's our opinion, right? It's just our opinion. Well, so Take I, it as you want. I think that was a really good point that our dude made was the fact that because of the way the system is going to be, you know, you can cover your mouth when you do that, too. Because, right. you know, I don't want to mm. breathe that in. Thanks. I'm glad Ew. you want to share. Gross. But yeah, no, I think I think one of the cool things that, you know, we were touching on was the fact that because of it, you know, it's a rating system, there's always gonna be some kind of an upset in the sense where you're gonna get what most would feel is an inaccurate representation of the information. Well, if one movie rates higher than another that you wouldn't like, oh, but that movie was so much better than you know. It's it's well, not saying that it's not as good or better. Yeah, it's just because it's on that scale that we're using, which I, I made the the frame of reference was like, you know, if, if Forrest Gump got overturned by super troopers and it's like, all right, Forrest Gump is obviously a way more intelligently written. I'd yeah. be surprised if that happened. That would be quite an upset. But if it happens, it happens. Well, it's, it's like if, if if we set certain parameters and we don't move from those and we use our personal judgment how to select certain scenes based on or, you know, yeah, the quotes are right. I mean, it is what it is. Well, and to me, and that's that's why I like because in our frame, or in within our system, I think the 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 outcome would be that yeah, you know what, Super Troopers might actually trump freaking Forrest Gump. It might do it. Mm, well, it, I don't think it would be by a landslide though. If it well, did, no. it wouldn't be my much. I I, I don't. I'd be curious to see the outcome of that one. Well, and that's, but you know, I, I definitely think it's uh, within that capacity. Again. 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 Uh, Dude, come on, man. This, all right, just keep talking. Is this like your first time? Is this what it is? Is this. Hair <coughs> better? It's, no, it's not, because you don't, you're not, you're putting your hand there is not covering. That's just like blocking. Putting my. All right, just just talk. I, just, I'm trying, but you're over here coughing. Oh, my goodness. Tra I'm trying to, I'm trying to listen to the chlorophyll <laughs> guy over here. <laughs> talk about Lord knows nothing. what. Go ahead, hit a sample sound. I am not. That's not what this is about. It could be. What do you know? It's not. 
It's about whatever you want it to be about. Well, and that's why, yeah, again, I, I like the Just idea that deep into yourself. we really could. No, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> nobody wants to go spelunking into my soul. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Well, okay, you want some mustache ride? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Oh yeah, me too. Yeah, no, it's uh, and that dude. So that's my exact point. Is there's so many amazing scenes and super troopers because of how like outlandish it is that within that system, like we we you know it probably would override quite a few movies where it's like, dude, there's no that how does no that doesn't. It's like yeah, totally happened that way. Well, Forrest Gump has a lot of very quotable. It doesn't necessarily have to be comedy. You know, that's the thing too. It doesn't, it could be from an action movie. It could be something just, you know, whether it's funny or serious or scary or, you know, however it grabs you. Well, yeah. I mean, you get like Predator or whatever. You know, you got freaking Arnold Schwarzenegger. Get to the chopper. Hurry, <laughs> do it now. Run, hurry, do it. And it's just like, yeah. You know. But I mean, I'd be curious about the rating system though. Like if you're, it, so say, say you picked one through three as being like, you know, one was a decent quote, two was like even better, and three was like, oh my God, that was freaking hilarious. I'll remember it forever. Like, so if you rate each quote that you save in your file when you truncate that movie, you know, the the rating isn't from comedy to drama to depending on what the quote is. Like, it's not to say that it's a better movie. It's to, you know what I'm saying? That's the weird thing. Like you're, you're trying to compare like apples to oranges in yeah. some senses. Like it doesn't necessarily mean it's a better movie. It just means by that rating system for dialogue driven movies, you know, one might trump the other, but well, and I think you make an excellent point in that where <laughs> even, even the scale of, all right, so it's quotable and we record it. There's also a component where you could give that quote its own index, which would either detract or increase, you know, its overall potential. Well, so that, and I think that's um, that's what my buddy was trying to introduce was the whole idea that that it's not just uh, like what we were saying a percentage basis and a number of minutes throughout the entire movie. Yeah, the ratio of how quotable just, because just it's, that you know it's like twenty minutes of one hundred and twenty minutes. That's you know, you know, one sixth of the movie is quotable. But he added that additional factor where it's like, okay, well, all the quotes you pick, you have to judge them based on a system, whether it's one through three, one through five, or even one and two. Like just so you have some kind of a, you know, because total minutes of quotable, you know, moments doesn't necessarily make a movie better. Well, correct and. We're not trying to classify one better than the other. It's more of just, you know, based on the idea of, you know, we call it quotability because it's, you know, how how much of it is actually a given reference or, you know, usable dialogue external of just quoting the movie where you can actually almost like play it into your conversation in a sense. Right, right. And to me, that I think that's the the level of quotability that we're talking about because it's not just like oh yeah, people would quote it, but yeah, people would actually use it. Yeah, and I don't I don't think it's necessarily just like you and I that tend to pick the same ones. I think there's certain ones that people tend to gravitate towards because they're the most you know emotionally stimulating, if you will. Well, yeah, there was a Home Alone where he's like you know keep the change filthy animal. It's a freaking movie, so they're you know you're quoting a movie within a movie. But yet, I'm pretty sure everybody would know that quote or would use it at some point. But I mean, the, the thing the thing that makes it really hold in your mind years after you've seen it, because now I'm, the last time I've seen that movie, I'm probably going on a memory that's at least five years old. You know, so, and that's for each movie that you've seen throughout your life. It's like, you know, you, you your memory of it. <clears throat> how do you rate that? Like how long an amazing quote sticks with you years and years later, even if you haven't seen the movie for a long time. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, and to me, it's also like music because there's, you know, there's plenty of, you know, I'll even, I'll use my dad as a reference. You know, he can't remember what he had for lunch yesterday, but that man can recite like every lyric from, you know, a Led Zeppelin album or, you know, so it's like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, That's a talent. I guess. <laughs> That's a talent. I, I make fun of him for it all the time. You know, he'll sit there and start like quoting all the, you know, I'm just like, dude, what'd you have for lunch yesterday? Yeah, that's what I thought. 
Yeah. There's only so much room in there. Sometimes, you know. You got to just dump stuff out, right? Like, I don't, you know, I don't need that. Well, yeah, and I think, I mean, I think that's a great point that you that you brought up is of the fact that, yeah, you know, it, it could be a decade or two decades later, and yet somehow when that movie comes on or that song comes on or, you know, you just you just start spitting with it, and it's, yeah. And there, there are certain lines that, you know, like we were saying, that, you know, there's many, many quotable moments in movies that people don't necessarily often quote, but they're still good quotable moments. But I think in general, people tend to gravitate towards certain ones because they seem to hold more whatever it is. It, the, the, the dialogue that was used, the way it was delivered, whatever it is just happens to stick with you. It, it strikes a chord. Well, right. I mean, it could even be the, like the context in which you heard it because maybe it was with <clears> that <throat> one person that you have those kind of conversations with, like, you know, you and I in that sense. But, you know, maybe it was like you were with your cousin or your brother, or your sister, or your dad, or, yeah. Oh, who knows? Maybe the first time you saw a certain movie, it was like with your first girlfriend or the night of your first kiss. It could bring all kinds of memories back to get, you know, it's why I said, you know, sometimes between movies and music, like, not that they motivate the direction of our lives, but they, they motivate some of the emotional content within them, you know, because it's, it's certain songs that you can listen to. Like, you know, if I haven't listened to a song for 10 years now, but you know, that song was integral at a certain moment of my life that was very pivotal. Like it'll bring back all those memories. See, in me, when it comes to like music specifically is I just really enjoy an album I would listen to it over and over and over and over again. So even to today, you know, if it, one of those songs pops on, yeah, dude, I know every. I can't write it down, but as soon as the song comes on, I'm right there with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So I, I find that comical, but yeah, that's that's probably that's probably like my my style of. And some of that stuff is on a level of its own. Like when you mentioned something like Led Zeppelin, <laughs> you know, Led Zeppelin had a, a tendency to to make a lot of their music was very timeless. I mean, you could listen to it. 20 years ago you could listen to it 20 years from now and it's still like it still has the same you know gravity to it it still has the same oomph yeah it, do, it doesn't seem like hey that's old music or you know the context is off because the context was always off it was the way it was written it was very artistic it was well and I think that's probably the <clears throat> thing that allows for our brains to make those kind of emotional connections for our memories because it is a, you know, it's an expression because it is a, you know, an emotional output. So it's context alone of just what it is as a component is, you know, to me, it makes sense that it's going to have an emotional connection as well. Cause it's, you know, I mean, <laughs> it is, it's an emotional expression. So, it just it allows it to tie itself together to that memory that much easier. But I mean, it, there is like you said. Well, I don't know if you were getting towards that or not, but that some don't even necessarily have a specific memory tied to them at all because they do have that timeless nature. I mean, there's a lot of um, <clears throat> you know Pink Floyd music that not that it brings me back to necessarily a specific time, but that it's just it puts you in that place every time. I get that. You know what I mean? There's certain songs, especially if you're able to listen to them by yourself in, in a rel relatively dim lit room and you can kind of relax and just enjoy the music. Like that's one of those artists that I could just, I fall into the song, you know, yeah. and they're not the only artist. That's just one I'm thinking of off the top of my head. But well, I, mean, I, I think that's <clears throat> a, I mean, I think it's a fair, reference. but it doesn't have the same effect as like, I mean, I can enjoy like, uh, you know, that really popular vanilla was it Ice Ice Baby. Like, Under I can pressure. enjoy that for what it was and the memories that it brings back, and it's funny, but it doesn't hold that same kind of timeless quality that certain types of music have. You know, how, how many how many years did was Led Zeppelin's you know one, two, and three out before I bought them as a kid when I was like fourteen years old? But it was still like it still held that you know, awe for me as, uh, 
I would say like the doors. The, the doors is the definitely doors a group did, that would, uh, yeah. you know, they would also get into that. I mean, I think a lot of like, you know, that era. It was the message you were connecting to with some of the lyrics though. I mean, like break on through to the other side, like the whole. Well, yeah, but you know, there's also like the Doobie Brothers, uh, you sure. know, CCR, Credence, Definitely. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. I think CSR was what I used to listen to. Yeah. C CCR. No, no, no. Um, Crosby, Stills. Oh, Crosby. Crosby. Oh, I'm sorry. Crosby, Stills, Nash, CSN. <laughs> this sounds like Crosby. a really horrible like network. <laughs> <laughs> Tune back CSN. in on CSN. Great. Yeah, yeah, no. No, no, nah, it's just in. <clears throat> Breaking news yeah, coming you across suck. my desk. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's there's definitely you know a timeless quality to to more of that kind of stuff. You know, but that's also coming from an era where we didn't have a lot of distractions, so we <clears throat> we had that. I would say we had that emotional connection with ourselves to have that kind of expressive output. I suppose. I mean, and, and maybe it's it's not so much the attachment to the memories, but where the music itself came from too. That 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 ideal or whatever it was that was being passed through the message of the song is in itself kind of a timeless quality. I mean, I can still listen to Janis Joplin like she had written the album last year, and I can enjoy that for what it is. And it doesn't necessarily bring back a certain personal memory, but it brings back a memory of maybe what was going on in the world at that time. Well, yeah. You know, because that emotion and, and some of that comes through in the writing. Right, because I mean, that would be the context of which it was it was written or thought of to be written in. And to me, there was, at least in that era, there was definitely a wanting to have a more positive overall look on all things, you know, a greater, a greater sense of balance. So the, the music very much was yeah, formed the, the, in that fashion because it's, well, because it, it needed to be, that expression it needed to be that platform for you know bringing bringing knowledge or information to to the masses the beatles huge yeah and i couldn't even man i couldn't even select one single album that was most influential the beatles were just amazing and their whole their whole catalog was and uh, the same thing that it it doesn't necessarily bring back a specific memory other than like from early childhood because I was always exposed to that from my mom who loved the Beatles, always loved the Beatles. Well, and I think that, you know, like you were saying, it's timeless. You know, you can listen to that stuff today as if it was written, you know, last year and it, it would still... It still holds the same weight. It's Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, it's a valid point. Love music, man. All kinds of music. Well, I just like, I just, you know, enjoy an, an external expression of an internal view or belief system. You know, anytime that you allow yourself to express outwards, you're sharing. And, you know, to me, there's everything right with that. I mean, that's, you know, that's what we do here. You know, we're expressing outwards. We're taking that stuff that's internalized inside of us that, that we feel our belief systems our truths, the things that we, you know, believe in and, you know, we bring it into our conversation and we share it from our bias or perspective at that point. And I think that, you know, that to me, that that's an art and that's, that's our art, you know, this, this is art. Yeah. I, I definitely, def, definitely think this is art. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Well, that's to me, I mean, that's, what, <clears throat> that's all art is, is just in, in, internal belief or view expressed outward. So whether it's your emotion or a thought, you know, an overall idea, anything. I mean, anytime you take what you feel or believe on the inside and express it externally for everyone else to witness. Whatever form. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, you painting, paint, poetry. Yeah. Yeah, spoken word, you know, literally writing music film. and yeah, you taking pictures, painting the pictures. You, know, you could be, it could be graffiti. It could be skateboarding. You know, that's why I say, you know, your 
be be the best you at whatever you're doing. So even if you're a garbage man or a doctor or whatever the deal is, make that your art. You know, make your life art. Live live your art. I love that, man. The uh, the the life itself is the art. You know, the the painting or the song or what have you is just the mushroom growing from the fungus beneath. You know what I mean? It's just the surface. But there's yeah. Are we going back to the mycelium? Sure, always. <laughs> always. I love that. <clears throat> well, it's in you. It's in the earth. It's everywhere. Well, I think that, yeah, it's one of the discussions I, about I, it. I really, truly believe life as it exists now would not be possible without it. Well, yeah, I mean... You know, without mycelium to teach us kind of what they've learned along the way. You know, that was uh, what I referenced in like Avatar where they're talking about like the neural network of the planet where, you know, everything is intertwined in that sense. And it's more real than you'd like to think. Well, because, yeah, because you brought up the point where... I mean, you don't even have to get into string theory. You just look at it. Like, you can see that, that trees communicate with each other versus, like, what kind of nutrients they need. And they'll actually transfer back and forth. And the mycelium make it possible. And they still get what they need out of it without harming the plants. They actually have... This has been a long time to discover all this stuff and actually prove it and have it on paper. Well, yeah, to figure all this stuff out. But this is this is how... Um, large forests can basically be able to thrive. You know, all of different types of species will be able to thrive in the same area because they communicate through this, like you said, neural network of mycelium. Well, yeah, because I mean, you know, the the point that you brought up when we when we were first discussing it was the physical look of the mycelium very much is. Uh, you know, uh, like a replica, or um, you know, like, a or model. are we a replica? I don't know. Well, yeah, but you said it has that same has that same structural look of a neural network. But if I'm, I mean, if <clears throat> science is telling us though that they were here, and not even more than likely, like we're absolutely certain that that fungus was here long before, you know any life walk the earth that was animate, you know, anything above plant mm -hmm. that they have been here even before all that, that they were here before the blue green algae started to arise. Right. And that, the, that it was this, um, partnership that allowed everything to flourish. You know, so when, when land was there, to move on to the blue green algae couldn't automatically grow on the land, not really very successfully without growing a root system. Right. And it was the, the mycelium of the fungus and the fungal network that was already preexistent at the time when the blue green algae came about that basically formed an alliance with them and taught them how to grow roots, which eventually became, you know, the small plants, grasses, trees, shrubs, all the all the fauna, yeah, all the fauna that you know of, actually all ar arose from originally blue green algae. Correct. I mean, at least that's the information I, I have. <clears throat> so, what's to say that they didn't teach early animal to form what is now the human brain, or even the animal brain? The way it it routes, the way it reroutes, the way it you know. Like what is intuition? How does how is that possible? And that's well. So that uh, that exact expression of intuition from a psychological component, as far as like behavioral developmental, is as you make choices, you get outcomes. Your brain catalogs that information. From that information, it then builds uh, stomatic markers. And when you have a visceral response to something, it's because your body's reacting to it from previous experience, which could be your lifetime, but could also be genetically built into you from generations. But these are all the file folders that are accessed by your sub subconscious. Is that what we're going with? 
that that's a constantly thinking, moving apparatus that's always in the background. Your, your subconscious brain is, even when you're asleep, is always collecting data and comparing it with what it knows and filtering through it. You know, if you think about all the information that you take in <laughs> through your five senses, how much of that is actually filtered out that you never get a chance to see because your brain <laughs> considers it not important. Well, right. Well, that, that goes back to when you're building your habits or your program. But that goes back to the synesthesia thing, though. Like, who's to say that that's not more of an accurate view of the world? Well, correct. But yeah, that's you, your, your brain as you basically program it to ingest certain information. Yeah, as, as stuff, because that's, I made the expression of <clears throat> when you finally have a mentality where you've changed your outlook, your brain still wants to bring you stuff, but it wants to bring you stuff that you think about because it feels that that's your, your needs or wants. So as you can modify your focus, then your brain is now also going to take you know what it normally would have just shoved aside as information. Now it ingests that and pushes other stuff aside. So you're, you're still present in the same system. Your brain isn't concerned about you being happy, though. <laughs> your brain is concerned about you being healthy. So sometimes it'll show you things you don't want to see. It's well, not always a, like a good feeling thing, but it's always usually a good thing. Well, that's why I say it, it comes off of your habits of what you do as well as what your body has learned from your actions and the you know outcomes from those actions. Like um, stomatic markers are basically like well, what you were saying is ingrained memories that are so deep that they actually create a visceral response before your brain actually realizes what's going on. It's literally uncontrollable. Correct. A stomatic marker. So like a flop sweat. Would that be a stomatic marker or am I? Oh, well, yeah. So, I mean, same thing as, uh, you know, your stomach, you get, you Like know, someone comes into the room that you really don't want to see and you know that you're now going to have to face them. Well, so they, there's been studies where your body is so aware of that kind of stuff before you... The hairs on the back here. <laughs> you, but before that person even enters the room, your body's already picking up on it. What do you think that is, though? Is that energies, pheromones? I mean, is there is there a way to figure out, like, or is that really... Or is all of that which you might consider a sixth sense? I don't know. Yeah, so it's going to be all those things because maybe that person has a, a very strong sense, you know, whether it's like perfume or cologne or something, or it's... Well, a pheromone thing, like, you don't even realize you're smelling it necessarily. Right. It's 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 like MSG of, of the odor world. <laughs> it's it, No, I mean, the fact that it just, it literally controls what your brain feels about something. Like, it just, it automatically can flip a switch. I mean, there's something about pheromone, because we give them off. That's why certain people are more attractive, just naturally, because they give off a high level of, of pheromones. Well, right, and that's the thing, is so your body's able to pick up on that stuff. That's why I was like, so before that person even enters the room, your 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 body has you know the the nervous system has already your eyes are dilated your your nostrils are open your well, yeah, you're more attentive it's the already, hair stands up on the back of your neck yeah well, you know whether any of the subconscious whatever but you know it's already aware of and it's starting to prepare your body for the reactions that you should be having that it feels are the best or that you probably you. not that you should be <laughs> well right but that you will be having if you don't if you can't control it. Yeah, and that's, I mean, so that, and that's exactly it, is it just, yeah, so you can even have a complete reaction without even realizing you're having a reaction before they even enter the room, very much so to the point where it's... You sound like you're speaking from a specific experience, is it, no? I do, oh, yeah, I get them all the time. Okay, where you just kind of go, oh, jeez. Like, you'll just look or turn around and you'll be like, oh, that's what it is. Well, it, geez, I'm, I'm one of those people where you, I can walk into a room and, you know, I can read it. You know, I, you don't have to do or say anything. I can just scan the whole room and start to pick out the different, you know, vibes or energies that are going on because of body well, language, pheromones, like all this. Stuff. My, you're more uh, conscious of it than maybe a lot of other people, but I think everybody, to a certain level, can can read it, whether they choose yeah. to ignore it or not. But. Well, our brains are intelligent enough that they can handle that capacity, <laughs> but it's whether or not we've trained it to make it aware to us. You know, I'm very much a pattern recognizer. Like I just, the 
it's that's my it's like one of my gifts is to just note the different patterns. Like I mean, I'll see things that others won't. What is awareness? I mean, is it like you have that conversation with your own head where, oh, this is happening. I think like, so. What, yeah, is a, a, what is awareness? Because you could react to something without being aware of it and not realizing, because that's another thing. You could react to something that happens without being aware of why you reacted that way until later. Well, of course. And then once you start to realize those things or figure them out. or and start it almost to, makes you laugh. You no, know, it does make me laugh. It never <laughs> makes me laugh. Well, it depends on the situation, but I'm just saying it, it yeah, you're, at quite that easily point, can make you laugh. Yeah, at that point, you're now starting to establish your own patterns and categories as well as your reactions and, like you said, your awareness because it's... Like your body starts pumping adrenaline and you go, what the... F-? And then you turn around and you go, oh. <laughs> well, right, but as those reactions happen more, as you become conscious of the you know inputs and outputs... You're, you're going to, to be aware. You're going to have that, you know, that knowledge at that point, you know, you're, because your body's going to be aware of it regardless. It's just whether or not you are actually being able to pay attention to it or you want to, or, you know, whatever. So do you believe in all that mumbo jumbo stuff? <laughs> all of it? I mean, no, I mean, it, do you, do you get, think, do you think mentally you can reach a point where you're, you're open to all that stuff at all times and. You just quoted the saint. I don't even think you realize it. <laughs> Almost being able to predict the future and whatnot. To a degree, because, you know, again, our brains are really capable and it's going to make these calculations regardless. It's whether or not we're willing to allow ourselves to be open to it. You know, like you said, that being aware of it. Because that thing about intuition, and I wonder how many times... Like we always say with the the Tesla Einstein thing, the the headspace that they got into to like figure the Akashic Records kind of a thing to figure things out exactly. All right, yeah, when they would lucid dream and, um, I mean, would it be completely outlandish to say that everyone throughout history that has made one of these leaps and bounds in in scientific discovery or whatever discovery, even if in some cases it was literary, um if it wasn't because of a connection to that same thing. Well, but we call it intuition or we call it, you know. Well, and that's why I, I, I pointed out the fact of it can either be something that, you know, in this lifetime you teach your body with your reactions or it's something that's actually been ingrained into us, you know, on a genetic level because of, you know, successive um, Even deeper than genetic, I would say. I mean, because uh, well, see, the, the interesting the, things is, uh, the, I'm saying it becomes genetic because as mm. it goes from generation to generation, it now almost becomes. It was, um, oh god, what was the the but which genetic starts what, from a thought? Well, Final Fantasy. Remember when they did the movie Final Fantasy, the animated movie, mm-hmm. where they showed the planet and they were like fighting these weird demons that seemed to be almost like spectral. And do you, it, that's what it was. It was the past energies of other life forms that were already on that planet before. Right. The war torn planet. Yeah. So it gives you that allowance to carry over into, you know, that understanding or awareness of those, of those things. Yes. But were those spirits or were they just negative energy? Well, I guess for the movie they, they were spirits that had to be released or something. Yeah, which I guess would say would be negative energy, but what was the negative energy that was holding them in limbo? Right, and even though they were on a different level and not technically on this plane, yet they were, and they could affect you. Right. I mean, that was you know they were was, actually yeah they were they were actually killing people. Well, they were kind of trying to make it look like they were literally pulling your spirit out of you. Yeah, I think that. Oh, I think that's the the belief. Yeah. That was pretty creepy the way that they showed that. That was actually a really well done cinema. Well, not when we cinematography, it would be um, CGI. I guess. Well, yeah, animation. But that and that's my point is so just like the planet having those kind of energy levels of that information, you know, it could also be on a genetic level where that that information is just basically being inputted into you. I mean, you know, like we were saying with the Akashic Records. On top of that, built within our DNA could be the Akashic Records. 
And it's just the fact that we now allow ourselves to transcend or cross over to that other side of full awareness that we can tap into that information. Well, I want to question, like, <clears throat> I mean, the DNA thing, the, the, the DNA sh- sh- replicates itself in a certain fashion because of it starts at a thought. So it's, it's the mindset that caused the DNA shift. It's the thought that starts it all. Well, and because I, I think the that, things that's begin, like the chicken or the egg, right? Well, I mean, that's the thing. If you can believe in something like intuition, then you believe that the mind is something that's superior to the brain. The brain is just a reflection. It's, it's, it's God's attempt to make something that's, that's indescribable physical. So it, it, it creates limitations. See, I like the idea that but that the mind is so much more than just the brain. Like when you die, you don't have a brain anymore, but you still have a mind. What do you mean the con like consciousness? The, the conscious mind. Right. Well, and to me, that's what I feel like the brain is the hardware. Your soul is the software. Well, here you need to be able to access a physical memory. You, you have but to. But if you're <laughs> here as in a physical body, you have to access a physical memory. You know, there needs to be like data space and like a disk file or something like that, you know, within a physical tissue called the brain. Whereas as spirit, you are limitless. You oh, are. Okay. So, I, yeah, so you're just you're in the physical context of this actual body. And all I'm saying is that the DNA strands itself in a certain way because of mind first, not the other way around. And I think this really supports the idea that when you consciously are constantly you know projecting or witnessing very negative things well yeah just like the the water droplet you know the doctor uh, what's the the japanese guy i forget uh, whatever it, oh um where he was doing the the water technique of yeah, talking talking. polite to it giving it certain statements or being extremely negative now all of a sudden you get a uh you know an ice would it, well, yeah. well, they would do something as simple as just putting a, putting a decal on the side of two bottles of water and maybe even a control bottle of water. But one bottle would say, I love you. And the other would say, like, I want to kill you. Well, no, he would actually say these things. It wasn't just written. But right, yeah, but there, there was there was there a was number of different there was just um, pictures on it. Dr. Emoto. Yeah, that's really right. Dr. Because I, I always think emotion. That's why I got Dr. Emoto was his name. I can't remember. Yeah, I always just think Domi Arigato. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he did that. They would, they would shout at droplets of water. This sounds so ridiculous as a science experiment. But this is what you do, though. You, you right. test the limits of what you think is possible. And if you get no results or you get something that's not really definable, but apparently they would do this time and time again and they would get extremely similar results. Yeah. Like they would scream obscenities at a, at a droplet of water and then flash freeze it mm-hmm. versus sending loving thoughts to a droplet of water and then flash freezing it and seeing the difference. And with I Love You, you saw very symmetrical, very geometrically beautiful shapes. And with something like I Want to Kill You, it was just like this weird... It's just like you took oil and water and just mashed them up and really quick and just it. No, yeah, it cancerous, cancerous was a good description. Yeah, it was it just literally was like it looked like a can. So I would go, say chaotic. Well, so going going to my point of what you were saying with mm. that, I could see, you know, like you were saying the the conscious thought or the you know the idea that you have in there starts the DNA sequencing. Well, if that input is you know worrisome or very you know, anxiety ridden. Sure. If it's, if it's something of an extremely negative nature, it's going to cause that distortion in its outcome and create a weakness within your body. Well, yeah, which to me, you know, self, it doesn't take a whole lot of change. I mean, when you see how complex and the funny thing is, you know, science for years has said that there's, there's several strains of DNA that you can watch, but there's only one that we consider valid because it's the only one we figured out, basically. Yeah, but it's the only one we've sequenced. Right. There's other strains of DNA that we still have no idea what they do, and we call them throwaway DNA. Which, but it's total bullshit because it just because you don't understand what it is doesn't mean it's you know it's like looking at a server room and going, well, no, this one is the only one that counts. 
And it's like, no, they all count, but yeah, yeah. you just don't know what they do. Um, that there's a, there's a lot to that, that, that we we're not even close to, you know, chipping away at the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Which I love. I think that's so fascinating. Science will never catch up because we will have evolved again by then. And that's the beautiful thing about it. But I, I truly believe that. I, I believe to a, a, a very gr- great extent that uh, human consciousness has the ability to make physical change. I mean, that's what quantum physics tells us. Well, and that's why going back to your idea of like the thought starts and then the DNA structures, you know, depending on what your your input is to yourself as far as, you know, whether it's respectful talk or... Well, it's all vibration, right? Well, that's, that, and that's another key on it. So, I mean, you know, maybe that's the, the way it communicates because it's on that frequency. I mean, you know... It's you, not even communication. Like I was saying, if, if, if the structural reality of one element to another is nothing more than a difference in vibration, then vibration is everything. Vibration is the difference between you being angry and you being joyfully happy. Not happy like in the moment, like joy, like joy and love for the entire world. Well, yeah, I mean, you have uh, moments like that, right? The difference between that. <coughs> um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, well, to, to your point of the whole frequency and vibrating thing, the, the expression that we're all just molecules vibrating at a certain frequency or rate so that it solidifies us as an actual structure. Like that's one of the ways that, you know, you can express our existence. Well, what I think I said before, like cobalt is cobalt because it's vibrating at a certain frequency, you know, in a way that creates an atomic weight. Right. That, you know, if you, if you go and I'm starting on the theory that matter is basically mostly nothing and a lot of motion. Because if you look in, at the atomic level, that's what you see. You see a very small amount of what you might consider matter, like actual physical stuff. But what you really see is a lot of motion and the magnetism that holds all that together. That's what creates physical matter. Right. Well, yeah, it's, it's those molecules vibrating in a collective state to create that, that actual... Like I'm always, I've always gone into like, what I say these... Uh, thought experiments i've always gone and i love that thought experiment that i like that phrase you know that if you look at you know whatever it is in front of you any item you could pick up or think of even if it's a car or whatever that if all the atoms that make up that car were to stop moving it would make a pile of dust that you wouldn't even be able to see it would quite literally disappear Mm, that's pretty dope when you ever think about stuff like that, like if you think about what matter is, if matter is nothing but motion, if that motion is, were to stop all of a sudden, there would be nothing. Well, I mean, because I, stillness. Yeah. Well, but you, is returned to when you have external catalysts like temperature. <laughs> when you have you know extreme cold or extreme heat, it modifies that structure which then modifies its physical representation, you know, its, its actual output. But even to the extreme, um, matter, matter itself and something you would consider to be balanced within this world, something balanced is still quite in, in quite a lot of motion. Well, so yeah. even things that you would think of as being solid and very stable like a rock, are actually moving at speeds unfathomable if you were to actually be able to experience them at the same time, but well, you're experiencing this level of reality. So who's to say, and that's the interesting thing about Stephen Hawking's you know, many dimensions that he speaks of, because what do, you, what do you consider a different dimension? I mean, would the fungal mycelium network be a whole different mental dimension than we could even comprehend. Who's to say that's not intelligent life? Well, and I think that's a that's a really good point, especially in that kind of uh, situation. Because I mean, yeah, you look at a rock, 
you consider a rock an inanimate object. All right, so it doesn't move on a level externally that we're witnessing. No, but it's got a history. It's got a memory. If you think of it that way, I mean, oh, and it's still made up of atoms and those atoms are moving. It's made up of molecules. The molecules are moving. They're vibrating to solidify into a rock. So even though it's very stagnant or still or solid, it's still moving. But a rock's memory, unlike ours, it's 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 literally embedded into its slower moving molecules than ours. That's all it's that is its memory. It's it's very shape and structure tells you its memory tells you what it comes from and what it became i like that right well yeah i mean because like that there could be pieces of pieces of of dust in there that became a stone over time and then hardened even more as stone came on top of that and that there's a whole history behind it and then it becomes exposed years later because of a crumble in the, the rock wall the rock face and you know then it has a whole new life but that that rock has a whole history within it you know, a memory, if you will. Yeah, no, I like that, dude. That's but it's not a, it's not what we would consider a conscious awareness. Right. Knowledge of oneself, but, yeah. you know, that it's what, what is the difference if you look at it at that, you know. Well, see, and this is why I. That all even, life and all everything that we know of is nothing more than a vibratory pattern. See, and this is why, even though it seems to be an inanimate object or something without like a soul, I guess you would say, or a conscious soul, I still treat it as if it did. You know, I still address it. I talk to it. But it's still full of life energy because if it stopped moving, it would cease to exist. Well, and that, again, that's why I still, I, I acknowledge its existence because it has to. You know, that's the one thing I definitely believe is all of these things that are around us have to exist in the exact position and form that they are. Otherwise it wouldn't work. And how, yeah. And how, if it was off by point zero 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 zero, I think it was like 14 or 15 different zeros. If it was off and it was like zero 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 one. And if it's off by one zero, all this would just, the center wouldn't hold. It would spin apart and fall and there would be nothing. Yeah. Or it would just scatter, whatever. But that just doesn't happen. It would just be a bunch of molecules just like running around crashing into each other. And I've never really believed that it's as simple as the Big Bang Theory. Well, so I was reading this thing where the Big Bang wasn't the start of our universe. It was the collapsing of our previous universe. But what's the difference? Well, there is none. The beginning is the end. The end is the beginning. Like yeah, well, like the, we could argue this all day long. Chicken or the egg. Right. Yeah, you don't know the cause or effect. Because my big point is like, all right, cool. If that's how that worked... Where did all this stuff come from to begin with? Like, did you literally just have a blank page of just like white emptiness? Like, you know, the never ending story. Why does it gotta be white? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's. <laughs> um, well, I just, I mean, it is light. Like, I would say light. Yeah, I would say, so yeah, whatever, whatever. I'm a big Walter Russell fan. I would say it came from light. Yeah, but where'd that come from? See, that's my point. Well, so, it, yeah, you can go even further back than that. But it, so no matter what you do to have any and all of this, to have any kind of understanding of it, it has to have come from somewhere. <clears throat> what, what, what is that original origin? That's what I think is really funny, because when you think about the concept of zero, it wasn't always a factor. It was added. Yeah. But the concept of zero was because of people contemplating the concept of God. Zero resembled or, or embodies the concept of God because there's no imbalance. Yeah, it's a perfect circle. It's a perfect circle. It's, you it's the yin and the yang. It's the full balance. What is nothing? Uh, it's, it's, it's such a wild concept, but what is, what is nothing? And, and there you will find stillness. There you will find God. Okay. Because it's not a thing, right? This thing that everybody tries to understand what it's all about, it's not a thing at all. That's the problem. It's nothing. It's the nothing. I know, I just like, you wouldn't. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> For, yeah, the wolf just talking stuff. Um, well, yeah, because, I mean, to me, it's that whole, like, yin-yang. So if you have everything... You have to have no thing. That would be its balance. Well, sure. But yeah, what? 
you know, thought experiment. If you know, you have everything, what is no thing? Well, we don't, we still don't understand that concept because we can't find it. You can't find nothing. It doesn't exist. Well, and and that's why we can find space. Space is something different. And to me, that's getting caught up on the and semantics of the, the statement. Because to me, everything is all things and no thing is the opposite of all things. So it's not that it's a nothing. It's just that it's literal opposite. But what, what most people would try to define nothing as is empty space. But empty space is not nothing. Yeah, it's still space. Because you can't have something without having empty space to put it in. So that's definitely something. There's something. So it's, it is a really confusing. and it, Something it, it's a, on the wing. <laughs> there's something. <laughs> no, that's good. If there's something. It was something. About, it was about time for that. Yeah, on Ding. the wing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah our, our, our uh, fan base is not getting uh, ripped tonight. <laughs> They're just like, wow, I've, I've had two shots. It's Show sucks. I'm out Getting here. ripped in different ways. That's all you know. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I mean, I don't even think I want to know ripped what that by means. Knowledge. Ripped by knowledge. Ripped by knowledge. My brain is so powerful. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. You sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the smartest dude ever. Now. Man. What if CAT? Do I see that? <laughs> And that that really coming back. That's a great quote. Just it really represents the idea of you know like what what I think Tesla and Einstein and all those kind of cats were doing is they were putting themselves into the context of if this was the actual idea, if this was our mentality or you know our guiding forces for our intellect, what would we see differently? Like what would be those representations or outcomes? Or the concept of. What what you think is is completely ass backwards. Could be, but until you're willing to actually step outside of the entire context or the construct, you're not going to be able to see it. Because that's the interesting thing when you think about. And I, I keep coming back to this, and this is the uh, the other thought experiment that I always play with. And I told you before this synesthesia thing, and trying to imagine what that's all about. It's like. Well, like I was saying, your hippocampus, I think, is the part of your brain that that goes through and decides, okay, well, this is important and this isn't. And certain things are brought in by your five senses that your your forebrain or your conscious brain isn't aware of because they're filtered out before they even get to it. Right. Because, well, probably in most cases, it would make you go insane. I think that's what LSD and mushrooms and stuff like that maybe open up a little bit too. Well, so that's another part of the the stomatic markers is because if you're if you were consciously deciphering all of this information, you'd never make a choice. You'd just be running through the data. So your body truncates that information and ties it in with those stomatic markers so that you can have reactions so that you can make choices so you can keep moving. But I mean, okay, I mean, something that's really hard to put your mind around, but like if a certain flavor was purple and shaped like a dodecahedron, how is that information important to you to live tomorrow? So your brain filters it out. But someone with synesthesia sees or experiences all those things. I can agree to that. So... Your brain or the average person's brain, I don't want to call you average, but I'm saying the average person's brain has segments and separates certain frequency patterns saying this frequency is for sight. This frequency is for sound. This frequency is for what food tastes like. This, You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. But what happens when there's a whole bunch of stuff maybe that falls in between each of those segments where that divider is that's completely thrown out. You know, who's to say that when you eat a cheesesteak, it doesn't taste like red and it's like beautiful triangles layered on top of each other. Like you don't experience that, but it's not to say it's not happening, but it's not delivered to your forebrain yeah, with not, everything else. It's you're not filtered. consciously aware of it. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can agree to that. 
it's hard to put those kind of concepts in, but these are, these are some of the things sometimes that like when I'm just kind of sitting there staring off in a space that I do think about, like, yeah. you know, the, um, what, what happens to all that information? Is that what bad dreams are? I mean, is that where like, it just kind of goes, this is everything I didn't show you today. Here, go ahead. Like your brain is defragging itself. And it's putting it together with stuff that makes sense to you. So like you're trying to piece it back together, but it doesn't, they're all jagged pieces that don't really fit. Is that what's going I don't know. Like, See, to me, I would say that your, your brain's still ingesting it. It's still categorizing it, collecting it, all these other things because it could utilize that information for later. But I mean, do you think your mind already has it figured out and it's trying to tell your brain and your brain has to tell your conscious mind that exists within this? I mean, is that why meditation is so important? I don't know that it, it gets you a direct connection to your mind as opposed to your brain. See, I heard it more as like meditation was like you actually defragging, like it's shutting it, off. Yeah, it's it's allowing. Yeah, it's, it's like a reset, and it just clears everything out. Well, it depends on the meditation. I mean, I guess there's many forms of meditation, but I mean, there's transcendental. There's you know, mindful. There's what? Oh, you right? Continental. <laughs> <laughs> You're so silly. Con continental. <laughs> You know, Istanbul was once Constantinople. It was. Why they changed, nobody knows. That's why I have a bee in my bonnet. We can't be serious at all. Yeah, triangle man, triangle man. <laughs> I'm going to take a drink to that. I'm going to take a drink to that. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, you can go ahead and finish it because we're, we're pretty much at that Are point. Oh, really? Yeah, I know. I'm kind of disappointed. We were really in, uh, getting into this. This is a... Isn't that how it happens? We start getting into it, and it's That's like, what, oh, it's time yeah. to go now. We had some, we had some good minutes there, though. Some I'm liking minutes. it. Yeah, we had some good minutes. Yeah, yeah, but well, yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. would like to continue this at some point. You keep the change, you feel the. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's. Yeah, we were saying last time that that we um, lately have been going back and forth, but I think we had a nice mix this time. Well, you know, we started out with our ITY rating system and then we wound up getting into mycelium and then here we are unconscious, that I, you know. But hey, everybody, look, if, if this is the kind of stuff you love hearing about and you, you want to join the conversation or add whatever two cents you got, bring it. <laughs> All right. Um, with movie up. quotes, without movie quotes, whatever. Right. 220, 221, whatever it takes. I'm telling you, directionsandmusic.org. That's I-M-T-E-L-L-I-N-Y-O-U at directionsandmusic.org. Um, great to have you guys listen. Love you all. Um, much love and oh yeah, well, uh, well yeah. I mean, because you know, we want you to continue the conversation here on. I'm telling you with uh, with your with your lovable hosts, <laughs> Philly D, Mr. Gemini. Yeah, and we're uh, you know grateful that you all stopped in. And so, uh, as we always say, you know, uh, be good to yourself and be good to everyone else, fam. Love you. Peace. Peace. <laughs>